g. Objections to the Reformed Doctrine of Common Grace Several objections have been and are even now raised by some against the doctrine of common grace as it is presented in the preceding. The following are some of the most important of these. 1. Arminians are not satisfied with it, because it does not go far enough. They regard common grace as an integral part of the saving process. It is that sufficient grace that enables man to repent and believe in Jesus Christ unto salvation, and which in the purpose of God is intended to lead men to faith and repentance, though it may be frustrated by men. A grace that is not so intended and does not actually minister to the salvation of men is a contradiction in terms. Hence Pope, a Wesleyan Armenian, speaks of common grace in the Calvinistic system as being universal and not particular being necessarily, or at least actually, inoperative for salvation in the purpose of God, and calls this a wasted influence. He further says, grace is no more grace, if it does not include the saving intention of the giver. Christian Theology 2, pp 387f. But, surely, the Bible does not so limit the use of the term, grace. Such passages as Genesis 6 verse 8, 19 verse 19 x. 33 colon 12, 16, Numbers 32 verse 5, Luke 2 verse 40, and many others do not refer to what we call saving grace, nor to what the Armenian calls sufficient grace. 2. It is sometimes argued that the Reformed doctrine of common grace involves the doctrine of universal atonement, and therefore leads into the Armenian camp. But there is no good ground for this assertion. It neither says nor implies that it is the purpose of God to save all men through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. The objection is based particularly on the universal proclamation of the gospel, which is considered possible only on the basis of a universal atonement. It was already suggested by the Arminians themselves at the time of the Synod of Dort, when they asserted that the Reformed with their doctrine of particular atonement could not preach the gospel to all men indiscriminately. But the Synod of Dort did not recognize the implied contradiction. The canons teach particular atonement, too. 8. And also require the universal proclamation of the gospel, too. 5 and 3. 8. And this is in perfect harmony with Scripture, which teaches on the one hand, that Christ atoned only for the elect, John 10 15, Acts 20 verse 28, Romans 8 verses 32 and 33, compared to also John 17 verse 9 and on the other hand, that the gospel call must be extended to all men indiscriminately, Matt. 22 2-14, 28 2-19, Mark 16 verses 15 and 16. If it be objected that we cannot fully harmonize the indiscriminate and sincere offer of salvation on condition of faith and repentance with the doctrine of particular atonement, this may be admitted, but with the distinct understanding that the truth of a doctrine does not depend on our ability to harmonize it with every other doctrine of scripture. 3. Another objection to the doctrine of common grace is that it presupposes a certain favorable disposition in God even to reprobate sinners, while we have no right to assume such a disposition in God. This stricture takes its starting point in the eternal counsel of God, in his election and reprobation. Along the line of his election God reveals his love, grace, mercy, and long-suffering, leading to salvation and in the historical realization of his reprobation he gives expression only to his aversion, disfavor, hatred, and wrath, leading to destruction. But this looks like a rationalistic oversimplification of the inner life of God, which does not take sufficient account of his self-revelation. In speaking on this subject we ought to be very careful, and allow ourselves to be guided by the explicit statements of Scripture rather than by our bold inferences from the secret counsel of God there is far more in God than we can reduce to our logical categories. Are the elect in this life the objects of God's love only, and never in any sense the objects of his wrath? Is Moses thinking of the reprobate when he says, For we are consumed in thine anger, and in thy wrath are we troubled? Psalms 90 verse 7. Does not the statement of Jesus that the wrath of God abideth on them that obey not the Son imply that it is removed from the others when and not until, they submit to the beneficent rule of Christ. John 3 verse 36. And does not Paul say to the Ephesians that they, were by nature children of wrath even as the rest? Ephesians 2 verse 3. Evidently, the elect cannot be regarded as always and exclusively the objects of God's love. And if they who are the objects of God's redeeming love can also in some sense of the word be regarded as the objects of his wrath, 
why should it be impossible that they who are the objects of his wrath should also in some sense share his divine favor? A father who is also a judge may loathe the son that is brought before him as a criminal, and feel constrained to visit his judicial wrath upon him, but may yet pity him and show him acts of kindness while he is under condemnation. Why should this be impossible in God? General Washington hated the traitor that was brought before him and condemned him to death, but at the same time showed him compassion by serving him with the dainties from his own table. Cannot God have compassion even on the condemned sinner, and bestow favors upon him? The answer need not be uncertain, since the Bible clearly teaches that he showers untold blessings upon all men and also clearly indicates that these are the expression of a favorable disposition in God which falls short, however, of the positive volition to pardon their sin, to lift their sentence, and to grant them salvation. The following passages clearly point to such a favorable disposition, Proverbs 1 verse 24, Isaiah 1 verse 18, Ezekiel 18 verses 23 and 32, 33 colon 11, Matt 5 colon 43 dash 45, 23 37, Mark 10 verse 21, Luke 6 verse 35, Romans 2 verse 4, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. If such passages do not testify to a favorable disposition in God, it would seem that language has lost its meaning, and that God's revelation is not dependable on this subject. 4. Anabaptists object to the doctrine of common grace, because it involves the recognition of good elements in the natural order of things, and this is contrary to their fundamental position. They regard the natural creation with contempt, stress the fact that Adam was of the earth earthy, and see only impurity in the natural order as such. Christ established a new supernatural order of things, and to that order the regenerate man, who is not merely a renewed, but an entirely new man, also belongs. He has nothing in common with the world round about him and should therefore take no part in its life, never swear an oath, take no part in war, recognize no civil authority, avoid worldly clothing, and so on. On this position there is no other grace than saving grace. This view was shared by Labadism, Pietism, the Moravian Brethren, and several other sects. Bath's denial of common grace seems to be following along these same lines. This is no wonder, since for him too creatureliness and sinfulness are practically identical. Bruner gives the following summary of Bath's view. It follows from the acknowledgement of Christ as the only saving grace of God that there exists no creative and sustaining grace which has been operative ever since the creation of the world and which manifests itself to us in God's maintenance of the world, since in that case we should have to recognize two or even three kinds of grace, and that would stand in contradistinction with the singleness of the grace of Christ. Similarly, the new creation is in no wise a fulfillment but exclusively a replacement accomplished by a complete annihilation of what went before, a substitution of the new man for the old. The proposition, gratia non tollet naturum sed perficit, is not true in any sense but is altogether an arch heresy. Nature and Nade, page 8. Bruner rejects this view and is more in line with the reform thought on this point.